grabbed the president. She cried, oh no. The motorcade sped on. Reports say the wound could be fatal. Keep tuned for details as they come in. Oh, but we do handle just about all other kinds and grades of meat animals. Steers, heifers, bulls, stags, cows, veal calves, stock pigs, uh, stock calves, sows, boars, goodness sakes, wool lambs, shorn lambs, buck lambs, ewes, even a few horses now and then. And I think that's one of the special features of a terminal stockyards like the one here in South St. Paul, because no matter what the species or the grades, we handle them all. And often we'll get shipments into market that would be classed as tail enders out of a given lot of livestock, those that didn't do as well or sort offs from the better end. And sometimes when we ask where the better end of that stock... Here is further information on the attempted assassination of the president. AP photographer James Alchins reported he saw blood on the president's head following the shooting. Alchins said he heard two shots, but he thought someone was shooting fireworks until he saw the blood on the president. Alchins said he saw no one with a gun. Stay tuned. The reports are coming in. We interrupt this program for a CBS Radio Net Alert Bulletin. This is Alan Jackson reporting from CBS News headquarters in New York with a bulletin on an incident which just occurred in Dallas, Texas, where President Kennedy is visiting. President Kennedy and Governor John Connolly of Texas were both hit by a would-be assassin's bullets as they toured downtown Dallas in an open automobile a short while ago. That is the latest word that has just come in from Dallas on United Press International. Uh, the Associated Press, in its first report, says that President Kennedy was shot just as his motorcade left downtown Dallas. Mrs. Kennedy, who was riding with him, jumped up and grabbed Mr. Kennedy and cried, Oh, no. The motorcade sped on. Riding in the same car with the president for this particular motorcade was Governor and Mrs. John B. Connolly, the governor of the state of Texas. According to the last report, both the president and the governor were hit by the bullets. And now one more ad has come in. The president, his limp body cradled in the arm of his wife, was rushed to Parkland Hospital. The governor was also taken to Parkland. Clint Hill, a Secret Service agent assigned to Mrs. Kennedy, escorted the president into the hospital, and we are awaiting further word on his condition. We will repeat these details as they have come into us here in our New York news headquarters. A would-be assassin fired at the presidential automobile in Dallas a short while ago, hitting both President Kennedy and Texas Governor John Connolly. President Kennedy was cradled in his wife's arms as the car sped off to Parkland Hospital in Dallas. Both the President and Governor Connolly have been taken into the hospital for emergency treatment. An Associated Press photographer, James Altkin, said he saw blood on the President's head. He said he heard two shots but thought someone was shooting fireworks until he saw the blood on the President. The photographer, Altkin, said that he saw no one with a gun at the time. These are the details we have so far on this situation. We are awaiting further information that might come in by telephone or via the Press Association wires to our news headquarters here in New York. The president, as you know, was on a three-day tour of the state of Texas. He flew down yesterday and was preparing to make an appearance and a speech today in Dallas before flying on to the state capital of Austin for an appearance this evening. We will repeat the information we have of now. Both President Kennedy and Texas Governor John Connolly have been wounded by a, an assassin's bullet. We do not know the condition of either man. Both have been taken to Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas. This is the latest we have at our CBS News headquarters in New York. We now resume our regularly scheduled program. Stay tuned to WCCO. You may be certain we will keep you fully informed up to the minute on the events uh, and the developments on this most tragic occurrence, the attempted assassination of the president in Dallas, Texas, this noon. We will interrupt any programs for bulletins as they come into our WCCO News Bureau from our news-gathering facilities throughout the country. 
when a dinner demands perfection. Cure 81. CCO temperature in the Twin Cities is 36 degrees. Maynard is next with a farm report. Well, that's tragic news, isn't it? The attempted assassination of the president, and we'll certainly keep you informed of any information as quickly as we get it here in the WCCO Radio News Bureau. Had you looked, you would have also noted water flowing down the trunk as the rain continued. Here's Jurgen Nash with another news bulletin. Here is a summary up to date on this tragic event that has occurred in Dallas, Texas. President Kennedy and Governor John Connolly of Texas have been cut down by assassin's bullets in downtown Dallas. They were riding in an open automobile when the shots were fired. The president, his limp body, cradled in the arms of his wife Jacqueline, has been rushed to Parkland Hospital. The governor was taken to the same hospital. The president had spoken only this morning in Fort Worth, then he flew to Dallas. He was to deliver a speech during a motorcade through the city. Newsmen, some five car lengths behind the president. We interrupt this program for a CBS Radio Net Alert Bulletin. This is Alan Jackson reporting from CBS News headquarters in New York with more details on the incident which just occurred in Dallas a short while ago where President Kennedy has been wounded by a would-be assassin. He and Texas Governor Connolly were shot from ambush as their motorcade drove through Dallas shortly after the president arrived in the city on the second day of his tour. So far, there is no indication of how seriously either man was injured. Both were lying flat in their car as the automobile sped off to a hospital. Both men have been taken to the Park Lane Hospital in Dallas for treatment. Uh, the incident occurred just east of the triple underpass facing a park in downtown Dallas. Reporters in the motorcade with the presidential party were about five car lengths behind the chief executive's car at the time. It has been difficult to tell immediately whether the first lady and Mrs. Connolly, who were riding in the same car, might have been injured. They were holding their husbands as the car rushed off to the hospital. And we are still waiting more details on just what went on there. Secret Service agents in a follow-up car quickly unlimbered their automatic rifles. They drew their pistols, but the damage had been done. One of our correspondents on the scene is now in contact with us, so let's switch now to news correspondent Dan Rather in Dallas. Dallas police have just confirmed that Texas Governor John Connolly also was shot at the same time as President Kennedy as the two men rode in the same car in a motorcade from downtown Dallas toward the Dallas Trademark where President Kennedy was to have made a speech. Pandemonium broke out at the scene of the shooting as three shots emerged from somewhere in the crowd. The crowd along the route of the motorcade was four and five lines deep at the time of the shooting, the motorcade was passing at least three buildings, more than three stories. One child, aged seven, told authorities that he saw a man lean out of the fifth floor of one of the buildings and fire the shots. Police and Secret Service agents now have that building surrounded and are going through the building in a systematic search. Still, another witness at the scene said this man was an adult, said he thought he saw a man and a woman crawling along a walkway over the motorcade route, and that this adult said it was possible that that man and woman could have fired the shots. Dallas police say they have no information on the condition of either President Kennedy or Texas Governor John Connolly. Several reporters who were in the motorcade said that Mr. Kennedy had blood on his head as he was taken into an ambulance and rushed to Dallas' Parkland Hospital just a few blocks from the trademark where he was to have made the speech. This is Dan Rather in Dallas, Texas. That's the latest from one of our team of correspondents with the presidential party in Dallas. We will be getting additional details from minute to minute as we continue here. The shooting took place at 1.45 Eastern Time. That was just about a little over 10 minutes ago. President Kennedy apparently was shot in the head. He fell face down in the back seat of his car and there was blood on his head. Mrs. Kennedy, riding in the car with him, shouted, oh no, and tried to hold up her husband's head. Riding in the same car were Governor Connolly and Mrs. Connolly. Governor Connolly also was hit. We are not, have no information on how seriously either man has been hurt. Connolly remained half seated, but slumped to the left when he was shot. 
There was blood on his face and forehead. Both the president and the governor were rushed to Parkland Hospital near the Dallas Trade Mart, where President Kennedy was to have made a speech today. As you know, this was the middle day of his three-day tour of Texas. He spoke in Texas last night. He arrived in Dallas only a short while ago, was to make a speech at the Trade Mart there in a short while, and then go on to the state capital of Austin for a reception and a fundraising dinner this evening. The shooting took place within minutes after the presidential party arrived in Dallas. There are no details on just how it occurred. Secret Service men and Dallas police, as we have heard from correspondent Rather, have one building surrounded where they think the would-be assassins may have been located. Some of the Secret Service agents thought <coughs> the gunfire they heard was from an automatic weapon fired to the right rear of the chief executive's car, probably from the grassy knoll to which motorcycle policemen directed their attention as they raced up the slope. And a late word, Texas Congressman Albert Thomas says he has been informed that both President Kennedy and Governor Connolly are still alive after having been shot in an assassination attempt. That is the first word we have had to that effect. Congressman Thomas says he has been informed that President Kennedy and Governor Connolly are both still alive after the shooting attempt a short while ago. Thomas, standing outside the corridor of the emergency room in which both the President and Connolly are under treatment, said he has been told the President is still alive but is in a very critical condition. President Kennedy is in a very critical condition after the attempted assassination in Dallas, Texas, less than a quarter of an hour ago. The security police have the one building surrounded where, according to one report, the assassins may have been planning their ambush. There is one other report that a man and a woman were seen on a grassy knoll overlooking the motorcade route and that perhaps that was a, the ambush spot. Details are still scarce. The situation was a turmoil, as would be understandable, uh, immediately after the shooting took place. When the president was taken into the emergency room, a call was sent out immediately for some of the top surgical specialists in Dallas. As we mentioned a moment ago, the president was shot in the head. He fell back in his car and blood could be seen on his head. And a call was also sent out for a Roman Catholic priest. This is a standard procedure in serious operations of this type and is not to be taken as indicating the expected fate of the president yet. Our last report was that he and the governor are both still alive in the hospital emergency room after the shooting. The call has gone out for surgical specialists to treat the governor and the president. Congressman Jim Wright of Fort Worth says that uh, both men were seriously wounded in the shooting, but that they are alive. Vice President Lyndon Johnson was in a car behind the president's. There is no immediate indication that he was hurt. As a fact, there's no indication at all of what it might have happened to Johnson since only the president's car and its Secret Service follow-up car went to the hospital in the initial drive. So there we have the situation as it exists at the present time. Assassins attempted to shoot and kill the president of the United States and the governor of Texas a short while ago as the presidential motorcade drove through downtown Dal Dallas shortly after the presidential party arrived in that city. The president and his wife and the governor and his wife were both riding in the same car, the lead limousine of their motorcade, going to the Dallas Trade Mart where the president was to have made a speech beginning in just a few minutes from now. So this situation has dramatically brought the news that the president is in critical condition, seriously wounded, and so is the governor, but both men are alive and being given treatment in the emergency ward of the Parkland Hospital in Dallas. And we are awaiting further details and further information on the condition of the men and on the possible apprehension of the would-be assassins. 
We have had two reports that Secret Service men are surrounding a building where it is believed the would-be assassins are holed up on the fifth floor. There was another report that a man and a woman were spotted on a grassy knoll overlooking the parade route and that motorcycle policemen who were escorting the motorcade at that time quickly got off of their bikes and scurried up this route and went after two persons who apparently were hiding in the bushes. We have a further report from another one of our correspondents in the area. Let's go now to news correspondent Nelson Benton at the hospital. A few moments ago, there was still no official word on the president's condition from authorities at Dallas Parkland Memorial Hospital. However, Senator Ralph Yarbrough of Texas, who was riding three cars behind the president in the Dallas motorcade, gave reporters a description of what he saw as the president was shot and as his car followed the presidential limousine from downtown Dallas to the hospital. Senator Yarbrough told newsmen that he heard three shots. He did not see where they come, came from, but he thought he heard three. He said he then saw a Secret Service man beating his fist on the president's limousine. Senator Yarbrough told newsmen it was too horrible to describe, but he did tell pe uh, reporters that both Governor Connolly and the president were gravely injured. He said that the president appeared to have been shot in the head. Senator Yarbrough, as we say, was three cars back from the president's car. He said his limousine followed to the hospital. He only saw the attendants at the hospital carrying the president into the hospital. Thus far, no report, as we know from here, on his exact condition. This is Nelson Benton outside Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas, Texas. One further report has come into our news headquarters here in New York by the Associated Press quoting the Secret Service as saying that the president remains in the emergency room and that the governor has been moved to the general operating room of Parkland Hospital. One Secret Service man was overheard telling another that there was no need to move the president because emergency facilities are entirely adequate in the emergency room where he is located. We have a report um, now from one more of our correspondents on the scene. Our White House correspondent who was accompanying the president here is CBS News correspondent Robert Pierpoint in Dallas. President Kennedy's condition here at Parkland Memorial Hospital is apparently quite serious. Two priests reportedly have just gone in to be with the president, and according to Senator Ralph Yarborough, who was in the motorcade, the president's condition is serious. As far as we know, here is what happened. At 12.30 today, as the presidential motorcade was making its way through the crowded streets of Dallas, two or three shots rang out. The president's car immediately sped away, and we learned later the president and Governor Connolly of Texas had been wounded. We think the president was hit in the head. We are not sure. I repeat, two priests have gone in to be with the president. The situation looks extremely serious. This is Robert Pierpoint at Parkland Memorial Hospital. Our news bureau in Washington has reported that the Senate has recessed and that Senator Ted Kennedy, the youngest of the Kennedy brothers, was presiding over the Senate when the news was received. Kennedy, according to a member of his staff, was still alive as of 12.55 p.m. Central Standard Time, that is, as of 10 minutes ago. Mrs. Kennedy apparently was safe, and Mrs. Connolly also is safe. Both women were riding in the same car, the same limousine, in which the president and the governor were riding in their motorcade through Dallas when the assassination attempt took place. The um, governor, as we heard a moment ago, has been taken into the operating room. The president remains in the emergency ward of the hospital, and one Secret Service man was overheard telling another that there was no need to move the president because emergency facilities are entirely adequate in the emergency room. But as we have heard from Correspondent Pierpoint, the president's condition apparently is serious. A call has gone out for specialists. And two Catholic priests have been summoned to be with the president in this mm. moment. The president's mother and father have been advised that their son was shot in Dallas. They are presently in Hyannisport, Massachusetts, and are being kept informed as the details are available.
This, um, one further note. This just repeats the note we had a moment ago that Mrs. Kennedy and Mrs. Connolly are both safe. Neither of the women was injured in the assassination attempt that apparently seriously hurt both of their husbands. And while we are waiting for further details to come in from Dallas, here is our, my colleague, Dallas Townsend, with a summary on similar situations in the past. Dallas Townsend. Well, Alan, the most famous assassination in American history, of course, was the, <clears throat> excuse me, was the uh, <clears throat> assassination of Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president of the United States, who was shot by John Wilkes Booth in April 19, 1865 and died the following day. <clears throat> After that, there was uh, an attempt on William McKinley, who was president in 1901. William McKinley was shot on September 6, 1901, and he died September 14th after lingering for several days in extreme pain. A, an anarchist named Leon Shogols was executed for the crime on October 29th. In 1933, President-elect Franklin Delano Roosevelt was shot at in Miami, Florida by an anar anarchist named Joseph Zangara. The uh, anarchist missed the president-elect, but fatally wounded Mayor Anton Cermak of Chicago. Mayor Cermak died March 6th. Zangara was electrocuted on March 20th, 1933, just, uh, just about the time that Roosevelt was inaugurated president. When uh, President Truman was in the White House, uh, actually he was in Blair House at the time, uh, there was an attempt on his life by uh, Puerto Rican... Uh, super nationalists who attacked Blair House uh, in the early afternoon, fired at the Secret Service, and actually uh, shot and killed one of the Secret Service guards. The president was on the third floor of Blair House at the time. As I recall, he came to the window. One of the Secret Service guards looked up, saw him, and said, Get back, Mr. President, and he got back. Uh, the president uh, was not injured in that incident. Since that time, there have been no known attacks on the president until the one today in Dallas, Texas, against President Kennedy and Governor John Connolly. And as Alan Jackson has been uh, telling you, they are critically injured but are still alive at the moment, both of them in hospital. Alan? Outside the emergency room, in a buff-walled hallway, anxious members of the White House staff have gathered, including Major General Chester Clifton, the military aide to the president, and Brigadier General Godfrey McHugh, the Presidential Air Force aide. We have more information now from our correspondents on the scene. Let's switch to Dan Rather. Dallas police and federal agents have completely surrounded a multi-story building which was on the motorcade route directly across the street from the scene where President John Kennedy and Texas Governor John Connolly were shot a short while ago. Police say they have found four empty cartridges on the fifth floor of the building. Police with sawed-off shotguns and other weapons have completely ringed the entire area. One ring of police is around the building itself. Another is around about a three-block area in which the building is located. Police and federal agents are going through a systematic search of the building. Police emphasize that they have no definite information as yet as to whether the empty cartridges found in the building were those uh, fired from the gun which hit uh, President Kennedy and Governor Connolly. But police are working on the theory that the would-be assassin fired his shots from that five-story building which was on the motorcade route directly across the street from where President Kennedy and Governor Connolly were shot. Latest word from Dallas's Parkland Hospital is that uh, the condition of President Kennedy is being withheld at the moment there are conflicting reports as to whether the injuries are serious or not serious. Two Roman Catholic priests have been admitted to the president's room. No word yet on the condition of Texas Governor John Connolly. This is Dan Rather in Dallas, Texas. To briefly summarize the situation, for those of you who may have just joined us in the last few minutes, President Kennedy was shot and wounded a short time ago in Dallas, Texas, and so was Texas Governor John Connolly as their motorcade drove through downtown Dallas shortly after the presidential party arrived in that city, where the president was to have made a speech beginning just about now at the Dallas Trade Mart. The latest report in is that President Kennedy was given blood transfusions a short while ago as a result of the injuries he received in the assassination attempt. The president and Mrs. Kennedy were riding in the lead limousine, as were Governor and Mrs. Connolly. The two women were not hurt in the shooting, 
Both the president and the governor were shot. Both apparently were hit in the head. The initial reports say the president fell back on his face and lay on the seat in the car while his wife held his head in her arms. Governor Connolly reportedly slumped but remained in a half-sitting position as the car sped off to the hospital for treatment. President Kennedy and Governor Connolly injured in an assassination attempt in Dallas about a half an hour ago. And President Kennedy has been given blood transfusions. Governor Connolly, we were told a few moments ago, was taken from the emergency ward into the operating room. Surgical specialists have been called in, and two Catholic priests have been called in to be with President Kennedy at the present time. We are told that the president's condition is serious. We are not told of any details about his condition. The turnout, the crowd along the streets, which had turned out to greet the presidential party, had been estimated about 250,000 people, about the largest of the current Texas tour that the president has encountered so far. He flew down to Texas yesterday, as you know, and was to spend three days touring and speaking at principal points around the state. The shooting occurred a short time after the presidential party arrived in Dallas. And as we have heard from correspondent Rather, apparently it took place from the fifth floor of a downtown office building where police and security agents have now found four spent cartridges, presumably those that were used in the assassination attempt. The building has been surrounded. We do not have any word on whether any people have been apprehended and linked directly with the shooting yet. The heavy street crowd, crowds between the Love Field Airport and the scene of the shooting, the crowds that had turned out to greet President Kennedy on his trip into Dallas, were overwhelmingly friendly. The shooting occurred about a half an hour ago and immediately created turmoil and confusion in the crowd and certainly in the presidential motorcade. The presidential reporting party, the party of reporters and correspondents, were driving in cars about five car lengths behind the president. As soon as the shooting took place and the president and the governor were injured, Secret Service men and Dallas Motorcycle Police immediately waved that car on by itself to the hospital. And in the resulting confusion and the crowds, the motorcade itself was strung out for some distance, and it took anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes before all of the White House party finally arrived at the hospital. Let's hear now more from the scene as we switch again to Dallas and CBS News correspondent Robert Pierpoint. Human blood type B plus has just been rushed into the operating room where President Kennedy and Governor Connolly are being worked over by doctors here at Parkland Memorial Hospital. We do not know whom the blood is for, but the situation still looks very bad. As we said a little earlier, two priests have also gone in to be with the president. Here is an eyewitness report of approximately what happened at just about 12.30 noon as the motorcade with the president's car in front was going under an railroad overpass to enter a parkway, three shots rang out very loudly. Immediately, the president's car sped up. The SS, the Secret Service men, pulled out machine guns, and officers in the area began to fan out. The president's car sped directly to Parkland Memorial Hospital here at speeds up to 60 miles per hour. As the car pulled up, President Kennedy was bent over motionless with blood on his chest. Mrs. Kennedy was hovering over him, but he was lifted out of the car, and reporters noted that he was wheeled into the hospital. That is the last that any reporters have seen of him as he disappeared on a stretcher motionless into the hospital. I repeat that the latest information we have only is that Human blood has been rushed into the operating rooms. We do not know whether it is for the president or for Governor Connolly, both of whom are reported to be in serious condition. This is Robert Pierpoint at Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas. Here in New York, the New York Stock Exchanges have closed early for the day because of the shooting of President Kennedy. 
In Washington, the Senate recessed pending developments. As a word reached the Capitol there that the president had been shot in Dallas, the House was not in session at the time. Senator Mansfield, the Democratic leader, made the motion to recess at four minutes before two Eastern time. Senator Wayne Morris of Oregon said just before the recess, if there ever was an hour when all Americans should pray, this is the hour. Let's go back to Dallas. Here's another report by correspondent Dan Rather. The Dallas County Sheriff's Office reports it has arrested a 25-year-old suspect a man suspected of possibly being connected with the shooting of President John Kennedy and Texas Governor John Connolly. Also from the scene of the area where the President and Texas Governor were shot shortly after noon, Central Standard Time today, the police continue their search around a five-story building in which four empty cottages were found on the fifth floor. Another report from the scene of the shooting seems to confirm that one Secret Service agent was killed at the same time, President Kennedy and Governor Connolly were shot. This is Dan Rather in Dallas, Texas. We are gathering details on a tragic story that has occurred in today's American history where the President of the United States and the Governor of the state of Texas have been shot and seriously wounded, apparently, in an assassination attempt in downtown Dallas. There is an unconfirmed report that Vice President Lyndon Johnson had been wounded slightly. One spectator said he saw Johnson walk into the hospital holding his arm, and a short while ago, Mrs. Johnson was escorted by Secret Service agents into the emergency room where the president is. Police say they do not know whether the vice president was in that room at the time. But now we have this latest report, an unconfirmed one, that the vice president Johnson was wounded slightly. Let's switch now for news from the nation's capital as we switch to news correspondent Wells Church on Capitol Hill. Well, of course, Washington was probably hardest hit by this startling news. And oddly enough, by coincidence, the president's brother, Senator Ted Kennedy, was the presiding officer of the Senate when they learned of the shooting. Actually, he was calmly signing his name to a series of group photographs for visitors when an aide came running in with the word from Dallas. Well, most of the senators looked up, of course, obviously angry at the interruption. And the aide ran to Kennedy's chair. The senator threw down his pen, and the pictures scattered all over as he ran for the door. And the same aide ran from senator to senator, telling them the news. They'd just been discussing the proposed extension of aid to rural libraries. Minority leader Dirksen put his hand to his heart. Senator Wayne Morris of Oregon, who's been leading, who had been leading the discussion, well, he walked a few steps, and he stopped, and he turned... And then he ran straight for a side door. Others in the chamber at the time included Senator Mansfield and Senator Symington of Missouri and Senator Randolph of West Virginia all gathered at Dirksen's desk for a moment and then they all fled the chamber. Reporters crashed over each other in a dash for the doors. The usual scattering of tourists, no more than a hundred were left. Everyone completely stunned. At the moment, the Senate is in, was in, when I came in, the Senate was in recess on the call of the chair, but Roger Mudd, CBS News correspondent on Capitol Hill, has some later news than that. Roger? The Senate uh, has just gone back into session at the call of Majority Leader Mansfield, and when I left the floor just a moment ago with the ringing of the bells summoning the senators back, uh, Senator Dirksen said the intention was for the chaplain of the Senate, Frederick uh, Brown Harris, to lead the Senate in a prayer, and then the Senate would go out uh, adjourning uh, to await again the call of the chair. Uh, After uh, Senator Teddy Kennedy uh, quickly left uh, the presiding officer's chair, his place was taken by Senator Spessard Holland of Florida. Uh, The Senate at that moment was in the midst of a quorum call. The quorum call was suspended. Uh, Senator Mansfield got unanimous consent on uh, two uh, pending pieces of legislation, and then the House went into recess. Very quickly, uh, senators came flocking in from the cloakrooms, from their offices, from the uh, restaurant down below. And uh, in the back of the Senate chamber, along the uh, the uh, corridor that uh, backs the chamber, are two uh, uh, wire service machines, and that very quickly became the center of activity. As I went through, I noticed that one, Senators Inoue of Hawaii, uh, Symington of Missouri, and Gore of Tennessee, over at the other wire machine was uh, Harry Byrd, Bob Bartlett from Alaska, Stephen Young of Ohio, 
Herman Talmadge of Georgia, Dick Russell of uh, Georgia, Ken Keating of uh, New York, and Dick Russell was reading aloud to the assembled senators the news that kept coming in paragraph by paragraph from Dallas. The, uh, the Senate official who brought the first word in to Teddy Kennedy was uh, Richard Riddell, who uh, serves as a press liaison uh, official for the Senate and summons senators for reporters as they come in. Uh, most of the members of the Senate uh, uh, wells were almost too shocked to, to open their mouths. What I heard uh, uh, Albert Gore say was, it's just it's just horrible, that's all I can say. I went and talked to Jim Pearson, a young Republican from Kansas. He told me, I feel sick at my stomach. Many of the, many of the senators came rushing here to the Senate radio gallery, uh, expecting to find later news here than they might even on that wire. Uh, Senator Curtis, for example, rushed in. Actually, uh, his face was flushed. He was chomping on a cigar. And, of course, we weren't able to tell them any more than you, uh, the audience, have already heard. CBS newsman David Schumacher was uh, was in the gallery at the uh, uh, at the time uh, that Senator Kennedy was told of the difficulty in Dallas. Uh, were there any other impressions you got? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, Did you leave? we had to send him away. We're trying to have Dave. Uh... Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States is dead. John F. Kennedy has died of the wounds received in an assassination in Dallas less than an hour ago. We repeat, it has just been announced that President Kennedy is dead. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the 35th President of the United States, is dead at the age of 46, shot by an assassin as he drove through the streets of Dallas, Texas, less than an hour ago. Repeating this, the President is dead, killed in Dallas, Texas, by a gunshot wound. We repeat our announcement that the President of the United States, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, is dead in Dallas, Texas, of an assassin's bullets. He was shot, and Governor Tom Connolly of the state of Texas was shot, as they rode in a motorcade through the streets of Dallas less than an hour ago. Governor Connolly is in serious condition. President John Kennedy is dead. The 35th President of the United States, he was 46 years old. According to the Constitution, Vice President Lyndon Johnson will now succeed Mr. Kennedy in office. Mr. Johnson will become the 36th President of the United States, very probably within a few hours upon taking the oath of office. Well, as a matter of fact, Alan, uh, Lyndon Johnson is now the president, whether he takes the oath or not. He is the president.
The Star Spangled Banner. President John Kennedy is dead in Dallas, Texas. He was shot by an assassin's bullet less than an hour ago, and now the official word is that he has died from those wounds that he suffered from the assassin's gun as he drove through the streets of Dallas. President Kennedy is dead. Our new president is the Vice President Lyndon Johnson. For a moment, a brief biography on our president from my colleague Dallas Townsend. Alan, uh, Mr. Kennedy was the youngest president ever elected to office in the United States, and he was the first Roman Catholic president in the history of this country. Mr. Kennedy was born May 29, 1917, in Brookline, Massachusetts. He was the second of nine children born to Joseph P. Kennedy, a financier and ambassador to the court of St. James. During his school years, the president attended the London School of Economics, and he graduated with honors from Harvard University. He later served with the U.S. Navy during the Second World War, and during that war, he commanded a PT boat in the Solomon Islands, and he was awarded the Navy and Marine Corps medals and the Purple Heart. After the war years, Mr. Kennedy briefly became a correspondent for the International News Service, and he covered the Potsdam Conference and the opening of the United Nations in San Francisco. In 1947, Mr. Kennedy entered politics by serving as Democratic representative from Massachusetts from 1947 to 1953. He defeated Henry Cabot Lodge for the Senate in 1952 and was re-elected in 1958. It uh, could easily be pointed out right now that Mr. Lodge, whom Mr. Kennedy defeated in 1952, is now serving as ambassador in South Vietnam. Mr. Kennedy came within... <clears throat> came within an eyelash of winning the vice presidential nomination in 1956, losing to uh, Senator Kefauver in the last few minutes of a very exciting ballot. He succeeded in winning the Democratic nomination for president over Lyndon Johnson and Adlai Stevenson in 1960. That was at the Los Angeles Convention in July of 1960. Mr. Kennedy was chosen on the first ballot. During the presidential election in November of 1960, Mr. Kennedy defeated Vice President Richard Nixon for the presidency by a slim majority, only about 113,000 votes. The president's immediate survivors include his wife, Mrs. Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy, whom he married in 1953, their two children, Caroline, born in 1957, and John F. Kennedy, Jr., born in 1960. Mr. Kennedy was the author of Why England Slept, which was published about in 1940, and Profiles of Courage, which was published in the late 1940s and which won him a Pulitzer Prize. Mr. Kennedy was the recipient of a $1 million trust fund established by his father. These are just the sketchy outlines of a career which history will now begin to evaluate. Alan? Our latest word from Dallas is that Vice President Johnson's wife, after a quick check on conditions in the emergency section, has confirmed that her husband, the vice president, and now the new president of the country, was not harmed in the shooting in Dallas. Mr. Johnson was somewhere in the hospital, but it was impossible to determine his precise whereabouts at once. He was reported badly shocked by the shooting. Doctors are trying to keep him as quiet as possible. He is under heavy Secret Service and police protection. Throughout the Texas trip, when President Kennedy and Vice President Johnson had been in the same motorcade, as an obvious security measure, they have ridden in separate cars. The Johnson car has always been some distance from the Kennedy car, sometimes by as much as 60 yards. We see the reason and the value of this at this point. Today, the president was killed by an assassin's bullet the vice president, riding in a separate car some distance behind, was unharmed. Here again is Dallas Townsend. Alan, uh, it might be interesting to recall at this point the savage struggle which Mr. Kennedy and Senator Johnson, he was they were both senators at that time, fought for the Democratic presidential nomination in Los Angeles in 1960. They went right down to the wire... Uh, but at the end, after 
Senator Kennedy had won the nomination, the vice president offered his full support, and the first move that Mr. Kennedy made after getting the nomination was to ask Senator Lyndon Johnson, then the Senate majority leader, to be his vice presidential candidate. And this is, this is what has happened now. I recall those days as well as you do, Dallas, out there, and that, uh, as I understand, it took a good deal of persuasion to get Mr. Johnson to accept the post at that particular moment. I believe it did. As a matter of fact, uh, Senator Kennedy, after winning the nomination, went around to see uh, Senator Johnson the morning after at his hotel, and they spent a long time in conference together. And finally, as a result of that meeting, Senator Lyndon Johnson decided to leave his post as the majority leader in the Senate and lend his support to the ticket. And ironically, as many observers have pointed out since then, uh, it was the support that Lyndon Johnson gave to the president in 1960 which enabled the president to win Texas by a slim 43,000 votes, the state in which he was killed today. A late report from Dallas is that two priests who were with the president came out to report that he did die of the bullet wounds. President Kennedy killed by an assassin in Dallas, Texas. Uh, there are other little items of history and coincidence that will keep popping up throughout the day and for some time. Senator Lodge, now Ambassador Lodge, whom you mentioned a moment ago, is back in this country from his post in Vietnam and had a date to confer with Mr. Kennedy in Virginia Sunday morning. I think we might also point out, Alan, that Lyndon Johnson uh, worked very closely with the president throughout the last three years. Mr. Kennedy kept him constantly informed. He was a member of the National Security Council. He was the chairman of the National Space Agency and uh, the Space and Aeronautics Administration. And, uh, and he was fully posted at every turn on the details of administration policy. There has never been any sign of friction at all between President Kennedy and President Johnson. Everything has always indicated that they work together as a smoothly running democratic team, and perhaps this will now pay off in uh, what has happened. Government sources uh, now have uh, confirmed the report that we gave you, that Alan Jackson gave you a few moments ago. They have confirmed that President Kennedy is indeed dead. That report comes to us from Washington on the Associated Press, and it's the first report that we've had on one of the wire services that the president has died. This means, of course, that Vice President Lyndon Johnson has become the president automatically under American law. The president and his party had just arrived in Dallas just about an hour ago. The president was on a three-day trip to Texas, part of it for politics. This was the second day of the trip, and he had flown into Dallas and was due to be speaking at this moment at the Dallas Trade Mart, where he had an important speech which had been released a short time before by the White House and which, in fact, had been quoted and, in fact, published in afternoon newspapers and quoted on afternoon broadcasts. The president who went to Dallas to deliver that speech did not deliver the speech, and he is dead instead. Killed by an assassin, and we have had one report that Dallas police have picked up a 24-year-old suspect as the possible killer. Dallas. That report came from Dan Rather in Dallas. Uh, the uh, suspect is, was actually was identified as being 25 years old, and we haven't heard anything more on that for about 15 minutes. Uh, the original report was that police had surrounded a uh, five-floor office building in downtown Dallas and they had found four empty cartridges on the fifth floor of that building. Uh, it seems uh, almost certain that the assassin must have used a uh, rifle with a telescopic sight in order to uh, zero in so accurately on the president and Governor Connolly. Uh, but we don't know who he is. We, uh, there's no, uh, there's no uh, further report on who the suspect is or even the reason. And, of course, uh, speculation on his reasons for killing the president and trying to kill Governor Connolly would be idle at this point. Uh, we did have one other report that a Secret Service agent had been killed. We don't have the name of the agent so far. Uh, we understand now that a casket uh, for the president's body is being brought into Parkland Hospital in Dallas. It all happened very quickly. It all happened uh, 
Inside an hour, the president and, the, and Governor Connolly riding together with their wives uh, through downtown Dallas uh, on their way to the Dallas Trade Fair. About four shots rang out. Witnesses, eyewitnesses mentioned hearing two or three shots. The president slumped forward with blood on his head, blood on his chest. The governor also uh, slumped forward. Uh, the governor uh, is not reported seriously injured. Bill Stinson, an assistant to Governor Connolly, says he talked to the governor in the hospital operating room and Connolly was shot just below the shoulder blade in the back. And now we're going to switch again to Dallas, this time to Nelson Benton. I'm sorry, we thought we had Nelson Benton on the line, but uh, the communication seemed to have failed at the last moment. Uh, here's a, a late report. Senator Ralph Yarborough of Texas, uh, who accompanied the president to, to Texas only yesterday on the presidential plane, was talking with newsmen a few minutes ago and uh, collapsed in sobs as he told of witnessing the slaying of the president. And now we're going to switch to George Herman at the White House in Washington. Perhaps a thousand times, the man named Lyndon Baines Johnson, up to now Vice President of the United States, has told friends how his father used to wake him up every morning by whacking him across the soles of the feet and saying, Wake up, Lyndon, you're an hour late and a dollar short of every boy in town. Now Lyndon Johnson is 55 years old, and he's still inclined to worry whether he's still an hour late and a dollar behind every other boy in politics. Johnson is a big man, but without the easy self-confidence that many big men have. He's a warrior, constantly worrying about his position. Is he doing right? Is he still in the right position, strategically, tactically, politically? It's a symptom of this uncertainty that all the time he was running the United States Senate, a Senate majority leader with an efficient and iron hand, he kept in his three big offices three big full-length paintings of himself, mostly opposite his desk, where he could glance up any time and see himself slightly larger than life. Johnson is a conscientious man. He ran the Senate with rigid control, but let everybody have his say. Let everybody argue for his point of view on the floor of the Senate, and seldom, if ever, shut off debate or parliamentary maneuverings without consulting all hands. He ran things in the Senate, but he ran them without riding roughshod over the opposition, except in the usual way, rounding up the votes and beating them decisively in the boat. Lyndon Johnson has often been accused by liberals of being the Southern conservative in President Kennedy's official family. But he came to Washington as a strong New Dealer, so strong a supporter of Franklin D. Roosevelt that the president brought him here in his official yacht, and Johnson and Roosevelt consulted constantly on ways and means of getting Roosevelt's legislation through the Congress. Only more recently has he come to be considered as a conservative, mostly by those liberals who wanted a stronger civil rights bill passed than Johnson thought could pass the Senate. Johnson is the kind of man who sees no sense whatsoever in fighting for a bill when you cannot muster the votes for it. He thinks it's just plain idiocy to make a stand for the record, to make an issue, when you don't have actually the votes that can be counted to put the bill through. And so, for this reason, he has very often been considered as a conservative, more conservative than he actually is. Also, for political reasons, he has sometimes taken a more conservative stand simply by keeping quiet on liberal matters. Lyndon Baines Johnson, 55 years old. He's had one heart attack several years ago. It was discovered by his friend, Senator Clinton Anderson. He took care of himself and was able to actively campaign for the vice presidency in the last election, actively, energetically, perspiring profusely through the heat, but fighting all the way for his man, John Kennedy, to become the president of the United States. Lyndon Baines Johnson, 55 years old, now the next in line, the next in the spotlight. This is George Herman in Washington, returning you now for the latest to Dallas Townsend in New York. Well, the latest we have here, George, simply is that the president is dead. He died 41 minutes ago at 2 p.m. New York time, 1 p.m. Central Standard Time in Dallas, Texas. Just a few minutes, about half an hour after he had been shot, mortally wounded, by an assassin who must have used a rifle with a telescopic sight to attack both him and Governor Connolly. Eyewitnesses say that three, possibly four shots rang out, the president slumped forward uh, in his limousine. The car was rushed to Parkland Hospital, but it was too late. Uh, the latest we have from the Associated Press is that Mr. Kennedy lived about an hour. I think it was a bit less than that. Lived about an hour after a sniper cut him down as his limousine left downtown Dallas. And the mantle of the presidency has now automatically fallen on the 
vice president. Police in Dallas have found a foreign-made rifle. Sheriff's officers are questioning a young man picked up at the scene. This must be the 25-year-old suspect mentioned a few moments ago by correspondent Dan Rather, who is in Dallas. The name of the man has not been made public, nor has the name of the Secret Service officer who uh, apparently was shot and killed at the same time that the uh, fatal attack was made on President Kennedy. Lyndon Johnson, although he has not yet taken the oath of office, is now, at the age of 55 years old, the 37th President of the United States. Dallas, I think we might uh, emphasize here that the Vice President was not injured in the shooting today. There had been one report earlier that he might have been injured slightly, that he had entered the hospital holding his arm. Vice President Johnson's wife, after a quick check on conditions in the hospital, said that her husband was unharmed. He was not shot. And again, we note that uh, throughout this Texas trip, when the President Kennedy and Vice President Johnson had been in the same motorcade, as an obvious security measure, they have ridden in separate cars. The Johnson car has always been some distance from the Kennedy car, sometimes by as much as 60 yards. Incidentally, uh, to remind our listeners and our stations along the network, the CBS radio network will program continuously on the story of the death of President John Kennedy and subsequent developments until further notice. We are continuing to get details and more information from Dallas, the scene of the shooting. And reaction is beginning to pour in from all parts of the world. We've already had a cable from some of our overseas correspondents, Dan Shore, cables from Bonn, that the new Chancellor of West Germany, Erhard, who had been scheduled to fly to Washington Sunday to confer with the President, is automatically canceling his visit even though he had not at the time received official notification of the president's death. Alan, one of the many ironies in this situation is that the uh, assassination of President Kennedy occurred at a time when there were rumors, and, and former Vice President Nixon mentioned them, that the president might decide not to have Vice President Johnson run with him on the ticket in 1964. And now we're getting more information from the scene of the area, and for that... We're in satisfactory condition. Vice President Lyndon Johnson was not injured. He was riding in a separate car. Dallas police are believed to have surrounded the person who is uh, suspected of having made the assassination. However, no arrests have been reported at this time. And a dragnet is out in at least two sections of the city, one of them where the incident occurred and the other in the southwestern part of Dallas, in Oak Cliff. The news is now official at Parkland Hospital. President John F. Kennedy is dead, having been assassinated by an unknown person who was shooting a high-powered rifle from a window of a downtown Dallas building during the motorcade. Here at the Trade Mart, at first, most of the 2,500 guests who were gathered to hear the president were not aware of what had happened. The press delegation of some two or three hundred members of the press from all over the country first rushed to the front of the building when the bulletin was first made known privately and in the corridors, and then rushed back, got their notepads, cameras, and left the building in a hurry. Most of them have gone to Parkland Hospital, where the president has just been reported to have died at about 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. After that, most of the guests in the building still did not know of the incident, and it was nearly half an hour before an announcement was made from the rostrum that an incident had occurred. Then another announcement that the president had been shot. This was followed by two benedictions delivered by ministers here in Dallas. Dr. Luther Holcomb of the Council of Churches delivered one of them and made most of the announcements. Then people left, and the noises you hear now are of the porters and waiters picking up what is left of a luncheon that never occurred in honor of the President of the United States. It is not known just when Lyndon Johnson, the Vice President, will be sworn in as the new President of the United States. It is possible that that swearing-in may occur here in Dallas. Reports reaching Dallas from New York are that the New York Stock Exchange has closed because the traffic became too heavy upon the news that the President had been shot. No further word is known at this time. Stay tuned to the station to which you are now listening for a further report on these developments. This is Travis Lynn at the Trademark. That was our pool network radio feed from the place at which President Kennedy was to have spoken this afternoon and the reason for his trip to Dallas. He had arrived in Dallas only 
a short time before, and it was just about an hour ago that he was struck down by assassin's bullets as his limousine leading the motorcade drove through the streets of Dallas. The president and Governor Connolly were both hit by the bullets of a high-powered rifle fired from a fifth floor of a downtown office building. President Kennedy was killed. Governor Connolly was injured, but is not in serious condition. Mrs. Kennedy is still at the hospital. She was not injured. She was not shot in the assassination attempt and in the assassination of her president, her husband. A White House spokesman refused to comment on her condition. Vice President Johnson is under heavy guard and was whisked from the hospital by White House officials. President Kennedy was shot in the right temple. The White House medical officer, Dr. George Berkeley, said it was a simple matter of a bullet right through the head. The shooting occurred as the president and his wife, riding with Governor Connolly and Mrs. Connolly, were riding in the White House bubble top limousine through a crowd of 250,000 people in downtown Dallas. Ironically, the bubble top on the limousine was down for the trip through the streets of Dallas. For that reason, there was nothing guarding the president from the bullets that were fired by the assassin with his high-powered telescopic rifle from his ambush position on the fifth floor. The horror of the assassination was mirrored in an eyewitness account by Senator Ralph Yarborough of Texas, who had been riding three cars behind the president. He said, you could tell something awful and tragic had happened. His voice broke, and with his eyes red-rimmed, Yarborough said, I could see a Secret Service man in the president's car leaning on the car with his hands in anger, anguish, and despair. I knew then something tragic had happened. Yarborough had counted three rifle shots as the presidential limousine left downtown Dallas through a triple underpass. The shots were fired from above from one of the buildings, as we have since learned. One witness, a television reporter, Mal Couch, said he saw a gun emerge from an upper story of a warehouse, commanding an unobstructed view of the presidential car. The president was the first president to be assassinated since William McKinley was shot in 1901. It is the first death of a president in office since Franklin Roosevelt succumbed to a cerebral hemorrhage in Warm Springs, Georgia, in April of 1945. And now my colleague, Dallas Townsend, has some further background information on the president's biography. John Fitzgerald Kennedy has been dead less than an hour ago. And, of course, it will be left to history to assess his achievements as the 35th president of the United States. He began by dedicating himself to two important goals, survival of liberty at home and peace in a world shivering in an uncertain balance of terror. He invited the communist world to join in a new beginning of the quest for peace before what he called the dark powers of destruction unleashed by science engulf all humanity in planned or accidental self-destruction. Let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. That was perhaps the best known sentence in Mr. Kennedy's inaugural address, which he delivered in freezing temperatures in Washington on January 20th, 1961. And if there can be any keystone or hallmark of his administration, it can be said that that was the keystone. Mr. Kennedy suggested that both sides explore what problems unite us instead of belaboring the problems that divide us. Let both sides, he said, for the first time formulate serious and precise proposals for the inspection and control of arms and bring the absolute power to destroy other nations under the absolute control of all nations. And the president in that inaugural address, which those of us who heard it will never forget, appealed to both sides to make use of scientific wonders rather than scientific terrors. In that speech, which he never delivered at the Dallas Trade Fair, and the text of which has been made public, the president lashed out at those who he said confused rhetoric with reality. Mr. Kennedy would have said, and he did say in the advanced text of his speech, in a world of complex and continuing problems, in a world full of frustrations and irritations, America's leadership must be guided by the lights of learning and reason, or else those who confuse rhetoric with reality and the plausible with the possible 
will gain the ascendancy with their seemingly swift and simple solutions to every world problem. That was just an excerpt from the speech that Mr. Kennedy would have made this afternoon in Dallas and was about to make when he was struck down by an assassin's bullet. Francis Cardinal Spellman of New York, who was in Rome for the Ecumenical Council, has just said that he was shocked and grief-stricken to hear of President Kennedy's death. Cardinal Spellman, of course, is an old friend of the President and his family. Mr. Kennedy, during the years that he was the President, again and again put the Communist bloc on notice that he intended no softening of American purpose. Let every nation know, he said, whether it wish us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, or oppose any foe in order to assure the survival and success of liberty. Mr. Kennedy said the United States did not dare tempt the adversary nations by allowing itself to be weak. Only when our arms are sufficient, beyond doubt, he said, can we be certain beyond doubt that they will never be employed. And while he said he knew that neither he nor anyone else of his time would leave, live to see a new world of law that he envisaged, the president suggested that a start be made toward achieving a beachhead of cooperation in the jungles of suspicion. Mr. Kennedy wrote that eloquent inaugural address himself. In it, he said that the American people could bring to the cause of freedom an energy, faith, and devotion which would light the nation and set up a glow that can truly light the world. The president died before the world could really be lighted. Six members of the president's cabinet were out of the country flying to Japan when Mr. Kennedy was assassinated today. Just an hour and a half out of Honolulu, the secretaries were advised of the killing, and they immediately turned back. They are expected to go to Washington as fast as possible. The party was on the way to a meeting with members of the Japanese cabinet. In it were Secretary of State Dean Rusk, Secretary of Commerce Luther Hodges, Secretary of Labor W. Willard Wirtz, Secretary of the Interior Stuart Udall, and Secretary of Agriculture Orville Freeman, along with their wives. Among others on board were Walter Heller, Chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisers, and Mrs. Heller, also White House News Secretary Pierre Salinger, and Robert Manning, Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs. Mr. Salinger and Mr. Manning had already been in Honolulu for that meeting, that high-level meeting on the conduct of the war in South Vietnam, which was attended by Secretary Rusk, Defense Secretary McNamara, uh, Ambassador Lodge, and General Paul Harkins, the uh, chief of American forces in Southeast Asia. Presumably, all of these men will now return rapidly to Washington. We've had no late word yet on when Vice President Johnson, Lyndon Johnson, will take the oath of office, but we assume that it will be as rapidly as possible. Uh, I remember that when President Roosevelt died in 1945, Vice President Truman took the oath of office about two hours afterward in the old cabinet room of the White House. But regardless of when he takes the oath of office, Lyndon Johnson is now the 36th president of the United States. Dallas, I would like to pass along a memo to our listeners and our stations along the network again, and that is a reminder that the CBS radio network will program continuously on the story of the death of President John F. Kennedy and subsequent developments until further notice. We will be back with more details in just a moment. We will take five-second pause now for station identification. From studios in Minneapolis and St. Paul at 830 WCCO. When Alan Jackson of CBS announced officially that the president was dead, the stunning, the tragic news was broadcast to a group of listeners under the WCCO radio loudspeaker in front of the station. Tears were shed, passers-by were visibly shaken, some unbelieving. A taxi driver who had stopped for a traffic light in front of the building banged his fist on the side of his taxi as the radio announced, the president of the United States is dead. We talked with the men and women clustered under the WCCO loudspeakers. Can I ask your name, sir? My name is E.E. E. Dickinson, Grand Falls, Minnesota. Yes. Have you heard the announcement? I've just said a prayer in the St. Olaf's Church for the repose of his soul. Thank you, sir. Can I have your name, sir? My name is Joseph Larson. Have you heard the news? I just heard it. I, uh, I'm shocked. It comes as an uh, unbelievable surprise. Uh, that, uh, this is something that shouldn't happen any place in the world. You're right, sir. Yeah. Could I have your name? My name is Ted Odenbach. 
And you heard the news? Yes, I have. What does it mean to you, sir? I think the most shocking thing I've ever heard of in my life. Where did you first hear the news, sir? I heard it in the athletic club. Uh, I was eating lunch. On the radio or someone telling no, you? No, a waiter told me. I see. Thank you, sir, very much. I don't know whether you've heard or not, sir. The President of the United States has been assassinated. I just, uh, just heard it, yes, sir. Well, what does that mean to you, sir? Well, it means... I don't know just exactly how to express it. It's really a shock. It's something that we didn't look for in this country. It's been a long time, and we didn't think it could happen, I guess, sir. It's happened before, but uh, we thought Kennedy was doing so well that uh, he could... He could really do something for the country. Thank you, sir. Your name, please? Bodine. From Minneapolis? Yes, sir. Thank you. Could I ask your reaction, sir, to this startling news? Is the president dead? The president is dead, that's right. Well, I'm not, I wasn't a Kennedy man, but I think it's the most tragic thing that's ever happened in this country. It's been many, many years since anything like this has happened in the United States. Uh, do you feel that most people have come to believe that it couldn't happen again? I couldn't have believed that it would have happened again. I just, I just can't, can't believe it yet. And your name, sir? George Derner. Glad to, thank you, sir. Could I have your name? Uh, Jim Richards. I assume you're as shocked as everyone else is. I don't know what to say. It just kind of uh, leaves you speechless, as it were. It sure does. Could I ask your reaction, sir, to this startling news? I think it's the most terrible thing I ever heard of. I wasn't along with the man politically, but I think this is a travesty on the on, on our country who's trying to set a pace for the the whole world and, and as a civilized world. We don't know yet, of course, why it happened, but uh, there is no reason for this sort of thing. There is absolutely no reason. It's terrible. Thank you, sir. Could I ask your reaction? Well, it's just a terrible thing, that's all. Uh, it's a shock that that you can't get over right away. Were you, uh, by any chance, a Kennedy supporter or not? No, I did not vote for him, but I uh, I would rather see him uh, out uh, any other way. That's the sure thing. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's terrible. He's not... I think he has done many wonderful things uh, in spite of the fact that I was not a Democrat. At the Minnesota Press Club, where editors and newsmen from all over the state were gathered, the news was followed closely as it was broadcast from Dallas, New York, and Washington. The newsman listened as the incredible details were unfolded. Some of them blamed reactionary persons for the deed. Others said it must have been a racist. There was general dismay. Republicans and Democrats alike expressed their shock and grief at the news. The news of the assassination broke at the Hennepin County Courthouse during the noon recess of the Thompson trial. We switch now to Arv Johnson at the courthouse for a direct report on the reaction there. When word of the shooting of President Kennedy came to spectators during the luncheon recess in the Thompson trial, many of them clustered around the door of our emergency studios here in the Hennepin County Courthouse to listen to our radio. There were gasps of, oh no. Women were crying, and all during the recess, people remained listening, waiting for, and hoping against official word of the President's death. Just moments ago, as the Thompson trial was scheduled to resume for the afternoon, Judge Rolf Fossin excuse the jurors until Monday morning. This is WCCO Radio News at the Hennepin County Courthouse. As further details of the assassination in Texas poured out of the radio, people in all walks of life bowed their heads, many of them saying silent prayers for the president and the governor of Texas. Traffic on the streets in the Twin Cities seemed to be slow, and pedestrians with anxious faces asked other people on the street if they had heard the news. Flags flying over the Twin Cities buildings were lowered to half-staff in mourning for the president, and lowered flags were placed before the homes of many persons in the cities. White House Secretary Malcolm Kildiff said the president's body would be flown to Washington this afternoon. The official announcement said time of death was approximately 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. The Dallas Sheriff's Department identified the rifle as a 7.65 Mauser, the Italian-made army rifle had a telescopic sight with one shell in the chamber. The rifle was found in a staircase on the fifth floor of the building. The assailant had been in the building some time and had been eating fried chicken. General Manager Larry Haig of WCCO Radio announced that the entire regularly scheduled of programs on this station is now being preempted for a special memorial broadcast which will continue for the balance of the day.
briefly now to return you to our CBS correspondent at the Parkman Hospital in Dallas, Texas. Uh, Pamela Turner, Mrs. Kennedy's secretary, looks very drawn in a state of shock. The president's secretary, Mrs. Lincoln, standing by. The body is now being loaded into a white ambulance in a bronze casket and will presumably be flown to Washington. I will try to find out. Just a moment. We do not yet know for sure, but presumably the president is on his way now. The president's body is on his way to Washington. The ambulance is pulling away with a motorcycle escort. And we assume that it will be taken out to the Air Force Base where we landed just a couple of hours ago when everyone seemed to be in such a good mood, when everything seemed to be going so well. The contrast of this scene is just unbelievable to one who's participated in what was such a terrific welcome and has ended in such terrible tragedy. And now the doors of the ambulance are closed, the bronze casket uh, inside it. The ambulance is pulling away now from Parkland Memorial Hospital. This is Robert Pierpoint in Dallas. Uh, the very latest on that, White House Secretary Malcolm Kildoff says that the president's body will be flown to Washington this afternoon. The official announcement in Washington is that the time of death was approximately 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, which was 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time an hour and six minutes ago. The Sheriff's Department in Dallas, Texas, identifies the fatal rifle as a 7.65 Mauser. It's an Italian-made army rifle, and the Sheriff's Department says it had a telescopic sight with one shell in the chamber. Three spent shells were found nearby. The rifle was picked up in a staircase on the fifth floor of that building in Dallas, uh, on the fifth floor of which the assassin waited for the president and the governor of Texas to make their appearance. Uh, the Sheriff's Department says that the assailant had been in the building some time and apparently had been eating fried chicken while he waited for the presidential motorcade to appear. Reaction is pouring in. We gave you that uh, report from Rome, Francis Cardinal Spellman of New York, shocked and grief-stricken to hear of President Kennedy's death, uh, an emotion which we feel sure is shared by all Americans. Uh, Dallas, we have a word from Dallas that a Secret Service man there says that Mr. Lyndon Johnson is being kept from view for security reasons. It is not known at this time whether Mr. Johnson has taken the presidential oath, but all of the federal judges in the Dallas area are at the hospital with Mr. Johnson, according to this late report. I might point out, Alan, that uh, any judge can administer the oath. When uh, President Harding died in 1924 and Calvin Coolidge was the vice president, the oath of office was administered to uh, President Coolidge by his father, who was a judge. Uh, Coolidge was in Vermont at the time. Uh, when, when Truman became president on the death of President Roosevelt, the oath was administered by Chief Justice Harlan Fisk Stone. Uh, Chief Justice Earl Warren, the present Chief Justice, is now in Washington. Uh, Lyndon Johnson may wait until he gets back to Washington to be sworn in officially by the Chief Justice, or he may decide to be sworn in in Dallas by one of the judges there, who, as you said, Alan, uh, have been converging on Parkland Hospital. More reaction from overseas is beginning to pour in now. West Germany's new Chancellor Ludwig Erhard, who was to have visited Mr. Kennedy Sunday was informed of the president's death while on the way back to Bonn from Paris by a special train. He promptly said, The news fills the German people with deep grief. All those who had the lucky opportunity to make the personal acquaintance of President Kennedy, in particular the people of Berlin, are deeply grieved at this hour. And a short while before that, the chancellor, on hearing the news of the president's death, had canceled the trip he had planned to make to Washington this Sunday. The Armed Forces Network in Europe, in a direct transmission from Washington, announced the president's death to American servicemen and their families on the continent. 
In the Vatican, Pope Paul was immediately informed. News of the murder was received with dismay at the North American College in Rome, where the vice rector, Monsignor Chambers, said that he would inform the American cardinals and prelates who were dining at the moment. Cardinal Spellman, a close friend of the Kennedy family, said, I am saying the rosary for him now. The cardinal, attending the ecumenical council, said that Mr. Kennedy's death was a great loss to the country and to the world. And the Soviet news agency TASS carried a report on a flash basis on its international English language radio teletype circuit, announcing officially that the United States President John Kennedy has died in a hospital after an attempt was made on his life. The TASS news agency went on to say that the attempt, the assassination, was made by persons believed to be from among the extreme right-wing elements. Thus the reaction comes in from around the world to the death today of President John Kennedy in Dallas, shot by an assassin in Dallas. A reaction from Chief Justice Earl Warren in Washington. The Chief Justice says he is stunned and shocked. All of the uh, Supreme Court justices, the Chief Justice and the Associate Justices of the U.S. Supreme Court, were in closed conference when news of the shooting was taken to them by a court assistant. The conference ended at once. Later on, a court aide spoke briefly with the Chief Justice in the office of Mr. Warren, and the aide said that Mr. Warren was stunned and shocked. It was Chief Justice Warren who swore in John Kennedy as President of the United States on January 20th, 1961. Only last Wednesday, the Chief Justice and his associates with their wives were guests at the White House at the annual reception given by the President for the Chief Justice and the other members of the court. Dallas, a couple of more details, odds and end details, have come in on the assassination. Uh, an official of the Secret Service Bureau says the assassin's weapon appears to have been a high-powered army or Japanese rifle of about 25 caliber. We had a different report a while ago. The entire building where the sniper was located was evacuated. People were working in the building at the time of the shooting, and a Dallas police inspector named J.H. Sawyer said the police found the remains of fried chicken and paper on the fifth floor indicating, he said, that apparently the person had been there for quite a while, waiting for this moment in history. Sad to say, Alan, uh, no matter how many precautions the Secret Service takes, it's impossible ever to safeguard the president completely when he appears in public. There are always, there are always moments when the president is exposed to the attack of a lunatic, and we're sure he was a lunatic. Lucy Johnson, the 16-year-old daughter of Lyndon Johnson, was in class today at the National Cathedral School for Girls in Washington. Uh, I told Miss Lee, she says, to release her to nobody, no rather, an aide to the vice president says, I told the school principal to release her to nobody but the Secret Service. Miss Taylor, uh, Miss Willie Day Taylor, who's an aide to the vice president, now the president, and is a personal friend of the Johnson family, as well as a longtime worker in Mr. Johnson's office, went to the Johnson home to be there when Lucy arrived. The other Johnson daughter, Linda, who's 19, is a sophomore at the University of Texas in Austin. And as far as Miss Taylor knows, she is now in school there at the university. And now we're going to switch again from our CBS News headquarters in New York to Capitol Hill, and we'll hear now from CBS News correspondent Wells Church. There is no doubt about the bewilderment that is, is here at the United States Capitol. As a matter of fact, I would like you to listen to the statement by Senator Everett Dirksen of Illinois, the Republican leader in the, in the Senate, as he told of his reaction to the death of President Kennedy. There are some things that are simply incredible and leave one absolutely speechless. This is one of them. I knew John Fitzgerald Kennedy as a representative, as a senator, and as a president for 14 years or more. And my last visit with him was on Tuesday morning of this week. I went early to present him with a turkey from the Turkey Growers Association. He was so amiable, so affable, so agreeable. And he looked in the very pink of condition notwithstanding a rather rugged tour in the state of Florida. The thing that stuck in my mind most when suddenly he shouted to a lot of school children and to those managing this live turkey, don't take the turkey away until the children have had a chance to come up and see it. We visited about many things. 
politics, bills pending in Congress, the future, 1964, and everything that one can encompass within a half hour of visit. And suddenly comes this mortal blow that strikes him cold in death. I say it's an incredible thing. And uh, my heart goes out to the family. And uh, I'm a little, frankly, I'm a little bewildered by this turn of events, as I know the nation and the whole wide world will be. So first, my sincere sympathy to the entire Kennedy family. And in the language of the chaplain, as we had a prayer, in the hope that transfusion might infuse recovery, that uh, the nation still stands and the nation will live. No less distressed, no less disturbed was the Democratic leader in the United States Senate, Senator Mansfield of Montana. The passing of John Fitzgerald Kennedy is not only a tragedy for the nation which he so ably represented, but is, I think, also a mark upon the respectability and the responsibility of some of our citizens. This good, this decent, this kindly man, this harassed man who had so much on his shoulders and received from some people so little in the way of support in return. This man has now gone to his reward. And I will miss him as a personal friend. The nation will miss him as a great president. And the world will miss him as a great leader. One of the fondest memories I can recall is the cooperation and the support which the distinguished senator from Illinois, Mr. Dirksen, the minority leader of the Senate, gave to the president of the United States, a Democrat, time and time again when the interests of the nation were at stake. And I know how grateful he was to you for the many contributions you made, and I am just as grateful, and the nation is too. Words are... Words are useless to express one's true feelings at a moment like this. My, a person's perplexity is just too great in a tragic moment like this. Senator Barry Goldwater, Republican of Arizona, issued a statement as he announced that he was canceling his weekend uh, tour. He said, it is both shocking and dreadful that a thing like this could happen in a free country. The president's death is a profound loss to the nation and to the free world. He and I were personal friends. It is also a great loss to me. Mrs. Goldwater and I offer our heartfelt sympathies to Mrs. Kennedy and the President's family. Now back to CBS News in New York. Well, I'm sure that all of us could understand the feelings of Senator Dirksen, with whom the President worked so closely, despite the fact that they were on opposite sides of the political fence. And now our CBS News correspondent in London, Alexander Kendrick, is up. We've established contact in London. Alex, I wonder if you could tell us what the initial reaction in Europe is to the death of the president. Yes, the news of the assassination came to this country as the dinner hour began here, and it shocked Britain into incredulity and grief. Britons who had become familiar with the youthful Kennedy image and with his style of political leadership were perhaps more shaken by the act of murder itself than by any meaning it might have or any possible consequences. How could it happen was the question I heard most frequently. And this in a country where even though public officials are much more loosely guarded than in the United States, political assassination is the rarest of crimes. And where incidentally the strength of the presidential bodyguard has caused wonderment in the past here. Prime Minister Sir Alec Douglas Hume was traveling by road from London to Arundel for the weekend when the news broke, and he turned around and is now on his way back to Downing Street. 
The new prime minister was hoping to see the president in the new year. No statement has yet come from the government, but one is expected momentarily. Many Britons here, of course, have recalled seeing the president, at least on television, during his one-day visit in the past summer. And the political career of Mr. Kennedy and the personal fortunes of the Kennedy family are almost as well-known, of course, in this country as those of the royal family. Alex, uh, of course, the president had many close ties with the British. Uh, uh, he, was, he was a close personal friend of uh, Sir of uh, Ormsby Gore, the British ambassador now in Washington. Well, these are all family ties. Of matter, course. Uh, and uh, the Marcus of Hardington, who was his brother-in-law, who exactly was killed in so, action. Yes. What is the initial reaction, as far as you can tell right now, to, uh, the, pos to uh, the possible policy turn that will be taken by the new president, Lyndon well, Johnson? I think the British have over the years come to realize that uh, changes in the presidency of the United States don't necessarily mean changes in policy. They, there is a firm and lasting relationship between the two countries which sort of transcend uh, problems that occur from time to time. And uh, it's on this basis, I think, of uh, understanding and almost family uh, friendship that uh, they know the two countries will continue. Uh, President Kennedy was regarded as a good, although often a critical friend of Britain, if not by all politicians here, certainly by most. And uh, of course, uh, he had his greatest impact here during the time of the Cuban confrontation just about a year ago, when the reality of a possible nuclear clash suddenly dawned on this country. But even though there was some dismay at uh, uh, what some people, and especially some newspapers here, thought uh, was a, a rather intransigent attitude on the part of the United States. Uh, the British government firmly supported the United States and Cuba. Alec, uh, it's inevitable, of course, to wonder what the reaction of the Russians will be. The Russians, uh, who have lived for so long in a rather conspiratorial society where assassination is not the uh, event of horror that it is in this country. What do you suppose they'll think about the assassination of the president? Well, of course, they have uh, almost as long a list of assassinations as we have in our history. But I think in the case of President Kennedy, uh, there's more to it than simply the, the killing of a president. Uh, I think uh, Soviet Premier Khrushchev had gone out of his way to cultivate uh, an unusual kind of... Uh, uh, I won't say friendship because that's not the word, but certainly acquaintance with the president. Uh, after their first meeting in Vienna and uh, after the uh, long-distance confrontation over Cuba, uh, certainly uh, President Kennedy had come to embody for the Soviet premier uh, American policy. And I don't really think he will quite know how to take American policy in the absence of President Kennedy. I think it'll take some time for the Russians... Uh, to gauge the situation, see if there is going to be any change. I it, think that uh, Khrushchev, uh, who has sort of personalized, uh, almost beyond recognition, the idea of uh, of rule in, in uh, Russia, has also uh, uh, regarded Kennedy as personalizing uh, the presidential authority in the United States. And uh, when two uh, personalizations of that sort suddenly uh, come apart, uh, I think there'll be a little bit of uh, disarray in, inside the Kremlin. It does seem... Uh it does seem quite certain, Alec, uh, as we look back on the history of the last three years, that while uh, the United States and Russia have seemed to come to the brink of a showdown on several occasions, most notably in Cuba last October, the president and Premier Khrushchev did seem to uh, understand each other fairly well and uh, at times actually seemed to read each other's minds. Well, I, I think they both understood the realities of this 20th century, this, this nuclear age. I, I, I think since they were the men in charge of uh, the two greatest nuclear establishments uh, in the world, uh, obviously they knew uh, what the consequences were of letting those things uh, come out, of, out from under control. I think they, they were aware of the awful uh, terror, really, which was theirs to command, and uh, this was something uh, that gave them a bond uh, that uh, no... Uh, other statesmen in the world really have had, ever. There was a lot more that connected them, I imagine, uh, as you say, Alex, than uh, simply that hot line between um, Washington and Moscow, which I'm sure both of them hoped they would never have to use. Yes. Well, Alex, uh, it certainly has been a, a horrible moment here. The, uh, the, 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 this, this country really, uh, tonight, uh, has a pall over it. I mean, uh, just people are in just cannot believe that such a thing could have happened. Really, it's just something that staggered the entire nation. As we were rushing to uh, to CBS News uh, studios this afternoon, Alec, 
We could see people uh, stopping on the street and talking to each other in obvious disbelief. And taxi drivers were leaning out the, stru- out the windows of their cars, uh, telling each other about it. Nobody seemed to be able to believe that it could actually have happened. That's true. That's the feeling that we got here. It didn't, of course, this happened at around 7 o'clock London time. As I said, uh, this was just at the beginning of the dinner hour. People were listening to their radio sets, and the first flash came from the BBC uh, just one minute before 7 o'clock. And uh, people just turned from their radios and, and looked at each other uh, in, in blank amazement. It was just something that they couldn't believe. I don't recall since a, such a sense of stupefaction since the uh, death of President Roosevelt in April 1945. Of course, he'd been the president for uh, for over 12 years, and a lot of people had grown up with him, uh, so that he was he was the only president a lot of people ever really had known. So that perhaps the sense of amazement and shock and stupefaction was greater uh, when Roosevelt died of his uh, cerebral hemorrhage. But I'm quite sure that most Americans will feel very much the same way right now about the death of President Kennedy. Well, I think most Britons will feel the same way. Well, we have a note here that the, the Pope received the news with uh, dismay, according to uh, sources at the Vatican, and the Pope has gone to his private chapel uh, to say prayers for the President. He's expected to send him messages of condolences. Well, Dallas, just for your uh, interest, the President of the Liberal Party here, Lord Ockmore, has issued a statement saying, I would like to express our deep distress and shock at the news of President Kennedy's death. This is indeed a grievous blow to the cause of the free world and to the Atlantic partnership in which he was such a believer. And I think those sentiments stand for almost every man, woman, and child in this country. Well, Alec, thank you very much. I'm sure we'll be back to you later. And, uh, and I'm sure that all, that all people throughout the world will feel as the people of Britain do and as the people of the United States feel about the... Uh, the assassination of the president. Thank you very much, Alex. Goodbye, Dallas. And Dallas, if I can uh, come in here, there's similar sentiments are being expressed by other European leaders as might normally be expected. French Prime Minister Pompidou, for example, said simply, it is atrocious, it is frightful, I am overwhelmed. And in Madrid, a foreign office spokesman said, it is horrible, absolutely horrible, a most barbarous thing, Everyone in Spain is horrified. Italy's premier designate, Aldo Moro, said, Mr. Kennedy's stature as a politician in his great country and on the international scene was growing in these years of a courageous policy of renewal. And he added, The reason for which he was struck in a mad way raises President Kennedy even more on the moral plane as a great defender of man's dignity and equality. These, of course, are just a few samples of the opinions and sentiments which have been pouring in here from all over the world as a result of this tragedy in Dallas. Alan, just a few minutes ago, George Reedy, a special assistant to Lyndon Johnson, went to the White House. His mission was not known, but presumably it was in connection with Lyndon Johnson's assumption of the presidency. Senator Hubert Humphrey, the Democratic whip, Senator Humphrey of Minnesota, who tried hard to win the Democratic presidential nomination and campaigned vigorously against Mr. Kennedy in 1960, Senator Humphrey walked into the executive offices a few minutes earlier. He was described as silent and ashen-faced. Dozens of newsmen are milling around in the White House press rooms. Lee White, a presidential assistant on housing matters, pinch hit as the press secretary. White said, I'm sorry that we can't give you much information. The reason is that we just don't have it. The reason, of course, that Mr. White is pinch hitting is that Pierre Salinger, as we told you a while ago, uh, was on his way to Japan from Honolulu when the assassination occurred. Uh, along with several members of the president's cabinet, the plane has turned around and is coming back, and presumably it will make all speed for Washington. Uh, We're going to uh, pause again now briefly in order for our stations to identify themselves. We'll pause now for five seconds. This is the CBS Radio Network. From the studios in Minneapolis and St. Paul at 830 WCCO. CCO temperature 36 degrees. Here again are our CBS News headquarters in New York. And the big question now, there are actually, there are many questions. First of all, who shot the president? What is his name? What was his motive? Second, when will Lyndon Johnson take the oath of office? Because Lyndon Johnson is now the 36th president of the United States. For reaction at the Department of Justice, where the president's brother 
is the Attorney General. We're going to switch now to CBS News correspondent Charles Von Friend at the Department of Justice in Washington. Within minutes after the dulling news swept through Washington that the President had been shot, hordes of reporters converged on the Justice Department, looking for the President's younger brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy. The Attorney General was not here. He was at his nearby Virginia home. Several dozen newsmen and photographers paced this way and that outside the Attorney General's huge doorway, hoping for some message of substance from News Secretary Ed Guthman. There was no word. Up and down the long Justice Department corridors were signs of grief, which grew more emotional as the minutes passed and the blaring news from radios and television sets grew more ominous. When it was confirmed President Kennedy was dead, secretaries rushed from their offices, hiding their faces, convulsed in sobs. Many of them had been working for the president and his family before his nomination and election. When the word went out that the attorney general was en route to the airport, the crowds here silently drifted away. One Negro secretary still cried softly. Above her was a big, smiling picture of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. This is Charles Von Fremd at the Justice Department. Back at our CBS News headquarters in New York, there are more details coming in from the scene of the tragedy in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Police in Fort Worth now say they have arrested a suspect in addition to the man who was picked up in Dallas. The man picked up in Dallas has been described as a 25-year-old. Uh, no further identification beyond that. So now the Fort Worth police say they have a suspect in addition to this man. Because Mr. Lyndon Johnson is the new president of the United States, the Secret Service has immediately taken control of his movements, and there are indications that he may even now be on his way back to Washington. We are beginning to get more reaction from overseas, and particularly from the Soviet Union. Our correspondent in Moscow has just reported in, so let's hear the report of correspondent Stuart Novins. <laughs> The first news of President Kennedy's death by assassination came into this country by way of Voice of America's English news broadcast at shortly after 10 o'clock tonight. The city was dark. Snow had just begun to fall. The streets were relatively empty of people. At 10.30 p.m., Radio Moscow interrupted its program to publish the bulletin of the assassination attack. The bulletin said that President Kennedy had been shot, apparently by right-wing extremists, that his condition was serious. At 10.45, Moscow Television made the same announcement and then added a further bulletin that the president was in critical condition. At 10.50, the English language version of TAS, the overseas news agency, carried this report. It said, it has just been officially announced that United States President John F. Kennedy has died in hospital after an attempt was made on his life by persons believed to be from among the extreme right-wing elements. At 10.57, Radio Moscow again interrupted its regular service to announce that the president had been murdered. The announcement was brief, respectful, and it was followed immediately by the playing of slow, sad music. United States Ambassador Kohler told me when I was able to reach him at the residence, Spasso House, that he felt devastated. He almost mumbled as he talked to me in what obviously was great grief. He said that he and Mrs. Kohler had been at home alone, not a social evening, when the news came in. He said, I feel terrible. I can't even say what I feel. I'm devastated. At Moscow University, where several American students are living and studying, they too heard the first reports over Voice of America. Since the signing of the nuclear test ban, Voice of America in English has not been jammed here. The students at first refused to believe the report. Then, when doubting was no longer a refuge, there was silent shock and half-whispered reactions. What will happen now? It's terrible. One man just stood and wept. Russian students, friends of the Americans, came in quietly and shook hands and expressed sorrow. One Russian said, Kennedy was a liberal. What will happen in the world now? Friends of this reporter, among some Russians here, telephoned immediately when they heard the news. Since the signing of the nuclear test ban, Voice of America in English has not been jammed here. The students at first refused to believe the report. Then, when doubting was no longer a refuge, there was silent shock and half-whispered reactions. What will happen now? It's terrible. One man just stood there and wept. Russian students, friends of the Americans, came in quietly and shook hands and expressed sorrow. One Russian said, Kennedy was a liberal. What will happen to the world now? Friends of this reporter, among some Russians here, telephoned immediately when they heard the news. 
They offered their sympathy and condolence. One thought almost as if they too could feel what an American must feel when his president has been assassinated. This is Stuart Novins in Moscow. We should explain for our listeners that uh, there was a slight technical flaw in that report from correspondent Novins. It had been recorded by tape just a few moments before we switched to him. There was an interruption, as you probably heard, by the Moscow telephone operator. It was not a broadcast line, but a telephone line, which Novins used to make his report in. And in the recording of his piece, there was an unnecessary duplication, which we did not have time to eliminate before we put it on the air. The shock of the death of President Kennedy has spread to all persons. Henry Cabot Lodge, our ambassador to South Vietnam, who was on his way to confer with President Kennedy, grappled for words in stunned shock at the news of the assassination. Lodge is in San Francisco. He said, I was very fond of him and knew him intimately. We served in Congress together and knew each other before that in Massachusetts. Lately, he said, we have been particularly close because... He followed, not followed, but guided America's foreign policy. He took a keen personal interest in it and gave it a great deal of personal time. Lodge had paused in San Francisco on his way from a high-level policy conference on South Vietnam in Honolulu. He had planned to meet with Mr. Kennedy Sunday morning, but he says now that he will leave tomorrow morning for Washington and report to Avril Harriman, the Assistant Secretary of State. We should remind our listeners and our stations along the network that we will continue with the present programming on the CBS radio network and all regularly scheduled programs and commercial announcements will be discontinued until further notice. Alan, we now have the name of that suspect who has been picked up by Dallas, Texas police in connection with the slaying of a Dallas policeman. This story says the Dallas Police Department has arrested a 24-year-old man identified as Lee H. Oswald in connection with the slaying of a Dallas policeman shortly after President Kennedy was assassinated. Oswald is also being interrogated to see if he had any connection with the slaying of the president. Oswald was pulled screaming and yelling, according to this story, from the Texas theater in the Oak Cliff section of Dallas. This story uh, does not say that Oswald is the man wanted in connection with the uh, slaying of the president. It says that he is wanted in connection with the killing of a Dallas policeman. Uh, this, this policeman may be the Secret Service agent who was referred to earlier as being the man uh, shot and killed at the same time that the president was assassinated. Some more human interest reaction has come in to the death of the president. A taxi driver in New York City, 60-year-old Joseph Kaufman, when he heard the news, put his hand to his head and moaned simply, those dirty bums. And then he told his passenger, as soon as I drop you off, I'm going home. I can't work anymore. Alabama's Governor George Wallace said that whoever fired the shots must be filled with universal malice toward all. It is hard to believe that anyone would shoot at the President of the United States. A further word from Dallas is that Vice President Johnson, now President Johnson, is returning immediately to Washington and will be in Washington by evening where he is expected to be sworn into office. As my colleague Dallas Townsend has pointed out, that even before he is actually sworn in, he is the President of the United States. A tremendous traffic jam developed around Parkland Hospital in Dallas, White House officials stood by sorrowfully, looking stunned in corridors in a waiting room. For an agonizing minute after minute, there were conflicting rumors as to whether the president was still alive. And then came the official announcement that John Fitzgerald Kennedy, 35th president of the United States, was dead. Alan, something more on that arrest that has been made in Dallas, Texas. The man named Lee H. Oswald, that's the identification given him by the Dallas Police Department, brandished a, pol a pistol which officers took away from him after a scuffle. Police officer M.N. McDonald, who was cut across the face in the scuffle, quotes Oswald as saying after he was subdued, well, it's all over now. A large crowd gathered around the theater, the Texas theater in the Oak Cliff section of Dallas, and witnessed the arrest. Police had to, crawl, had to hold the crowds back because many apparently connected the arrested man with the assassination of the president. And as we said a moment ago, there is no such connection at the moment as far as is known publicly. The officer who was killed, J.D. Tippett, was killed by a man answering the description of Oswald in the neighborhood a short time before. Tippett had been slain with a pistol. 
the president was assassinated with a high-powered rifle with a telescopic sight, and uh, it may well be that that two men are involved here, especially since we had a report a few minutes ago that an arrest had been made in Fort Worth. That quite possibly is true, Dallas, and there will be some confusion for some time until all of this is finally cleared up. We also had a report at one time that one of the Secret Service men had been killed. Yes, But I haven't heard or seen anything firm on that. That's right, and I don't know, uh, Alan, it's impossible to tell from these uh, very disconnected reports coming in whether that Secret Service man is the uh, the same as the police officer, the Dallas police officer, uh, who was shot, according to Dallas police, and was killed by Lee Oswald. Now, uh, we're going to get a little background now on the Secret Service, the uh, the agency of the government that is charged with the protection of the president. So we're going to switch again to Washington and CBS News correspondent Charles Von Friend. Like many a man who has once had a close brush with death, President Kennedy was inclined to laugh at it. His widely publicized adventures as the skipper of PT-109 in the Pacific during World War II had left a lifetime mark on the president. He was inclined to minimize any physical danger from assassin's bullets. This reporter, who covered John Kennedy throughout the year of 1960, through seven primaries, the convention, and the victorious campaign, vividly recalls one night in June of that year, high in the skies over the Great Plains, and the Kennedy family plane, the Caroline. The primaries were over. The senator from Massachusetts had swept the board. He was relaxed and confident as he looked forward to the Los Angeles convention and the campaign ahead. For the first time, he seriously believed he had an excellent chance of not only winning the Democratic nomination, but of moving on to the presidency. He knew that I had covered the White House during six years of General Eisenhower's administration, and he was curious on this summer night, high in the skies, over the heartlands of the nation, as to just what the White House would be like. The conversation turned to the Secret Service. I explained that if he became president, he would no longer be able to move about freely as he had as a senator. It was apparent that Senator Kennedy wasn't buying this line of thought, even though the Secret Service has the authority to order the president to follow their instructions if they believed his life might be in potential danger. Mr. Kennedy shook his head in disbelief when told the Secret Service made arrangements for former President Truman's personal necessities when traveling and thought the agents running alongside President Eisenhower's automobile and motorcades only served to block the public's vision of the chief executive. He observed on that night... I recall the substance, if not the exact quote, so well, that there wasn't any sure-proof way to protect the president from a dedicated, able assassin. In his three years in office, President Kennedy did change some traditional Secret Service responsibilities. For one thing, he liked to drive a car himself, frequently took the wheel from the hands of the SS driver. He also liked to change schedules on the spur of the moment, and on occasion was unprotected until agents realized he had left their midst. It is tragically ironic that when the assassin's bullet came, it came at a moment when the president was under full Secret Service protection. But as he had said in the Caroline three years ago, if a composed madman with high grades and marksmanship wants to kill the leader of the nation, there is little the Secret Service can do about it. This is Charles Von Fremd at the Justice Department. We've received word here at our CBS News headquarters in New York that Officers at Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland say they understand that President Kennedy's body will be brought back to Washington this afternoon. Senator Ted Kennedy, the youngest of the Kennedy brothers, is said to be flying to Cape Cod to be with the Kennedy family. That is, with the late president's father and mother. There's more reaction now here in the New York area. Let's switch now to our CBS News correspondent, Bernard Eisman, who is reporting from New York's St. Patrick's Cathedral. The bells tolled on Fifth Avenue, and the traffic noise became almost non-existent, something unusual for a day at this time in New York. And as the news of the president's death spread through the city, people of all faiths came to the Roman Catholic St. Patrick's Cathedral. They're streaming in now and coming out tears in their eyes, their cheeks wet from crying. One woman told me, I'm Jewish, but when I heard, I had to go to a Catholic church to pray for President Kennedy. Other people going in and out remarked only on the tragedy. They all seemed to be stunned. Come, and as Fifth Avenue becomes clogged with traffic heading for the cathedral, the bells continue to toll, and they toll the grief 
that is being felt by most New Yorkers. This is Bernard Eisman at St. Patrick's Cathedral on Fifth Avenue in New York. We've had yet another report on the possible time of Lyndon Johnson's official swearing in as the new president. This one is that he is expected to be sworn in as president aboard an airliner before flying immediately back to the nation's capital. A moment ago, we had a report that he would be flying back to Washington to be sworn in there. It is all uh, a matter of speculation at the moment and really academic because Lyndon Johnson became president of the United States according to the terms of the Constitution immediately upon the death of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, who died just under two hours ago in Dallas from the bullets of an assassin fired into him as he rode through the streets of Dallas in a motorcade heading for the Dallas Trade Mart where he was to make a speech this afternoon. The second day of a three-day trip swing through Texas, partly political, partly for speaking out on the issues in which he so firmly believed. President Kennedy never made that speech. He was killed by the assassin's bullets. The bullets also injured, wounded Texas Governor Connolly, who was riding in the same car with the president at the time. Governor Connolly is showing good signs of recovery and is not in critical condition, according to the last reports. So that our latest information is that Lyndon Johnson may be sworn in as president aboard an airliner just before flying back to Washington this afternoon. And now, Dallas, uh, I believe you've gathered some more bits of information over here. Well, Alan, uh, it, it's interesting to point out that Lyndon Johnson will be the second president of the United States to have suffered a heart attack, at least as far as known. Mr. Johnson, while he was the majority leader of the Senate, suffered a moderately severe heart attack seizure in the summer of 1955. That was more than eight years ago, and he spent several weeks in the hospital. It required all the discipline that he could muster to curb his energy and remain absolutely quiet for hours at a time. He stopped smoking cigarettes and reduced his weight from 220 to 190 pounds. Almost inevitably, uh, the rumor uh, cropped up again today, as soon as President Kennedy had been assassinated, that Lyndon Johnson, the new president, had suffered a heart attack. Frank Vallejo, secretary to the Senate Democratic Majority in Washington, has issued a statement saying there is no substance to rumors that President Johnson suffered a heart attack. Johnson, who was in the uh, presidential party at Dallas when Mr. Kennedy was assassinated, has been reported fine by his wife. She has denied a report that he also had been shot. The vice president is uh, apparently in good health and is uh, ready to assume the duties, the prerogatives, the responsibilities, and the awful burdens of the presidency. Alan... While we've been talking here, I've been thinking back to uh, some of the memories that I have, and I'm sure that many reporters have many more, some of the memories of President Kennedy. The first time I ever talked to him at any great length was in 1950, when he was the junior senator from Massachusetts. And I had a long talk with him one afternoon in his, uh, in his suite at 122 Bowdoin Street in Boston, uh, right near the Massachusetts State Capitol. That's uh, a, a, an apartment which the Kennedy family still retains and which the president always used for his legal voting address. At that time, the president was considered quite likely to announce for the Democratic presidential nomination, but he hadn't actually done it, and a lot of people felt he had very little chance of getting it. But I remember being struck at the time by feeling that he was at least going to put into the attempt everything that he possibly had, and as it turned out, he did get it. Mm -hmm. uh, we're getting still more reports and more reactions, and uh, we've had another one of our correspondents in the Washington staff check in with us. So let's hear now from Paul Niven at Robert Kennedy's home in Washington. At the time of the president's assassination, Attorney General Robert Kennedy was lunching at his home here with Robert Morgenthau, last year's unsuccessful Democratic gubernatorial candidate in New York State. The Attorney General learned of his brother's assassination in a phone call from FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. Within a few moments, a Roman Catholic priest appeared here at the house to give the family condolences. Another visitor was Central Intelligence Agency Director John McCall. He and Robert Kennedy walked for some minutes in the garden. Mrs. Ethel Kennedy, the Attorney General's wife, left the house briefly to gather some of her children from their private schools. When
When the party returned, the Attorney General welcomed them at the door and gathered one of his young daughters into his arms. This is Paul Niven at McLean, Virginia. A crowd of stunned citizens in Dallas thronged around the hospital where President Kennedy died. The ambulance which took his body from the hospital was forced almost to a halt at one point because of the silent and waiting people. Adding poignancy to the tragedy was the fact that both Kennedy children will have birthdays within the next week. Caroline will be six on November 7th, and John Jr. will be three on November 25th. Vice President Lyndon Johnson left Parkland Hospital this afternoon. And now we've had a later bulletin than that. Mr. Johnson has been sworn in as President of the United States. He was sworn in as of about 2.38 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That would be about an hour and 20 minutes ago. Alan, that must have been on board that airliner at Dallas because he doesn't, he hasn't had time to get to Washington yet. That's right. I think that probably that took place just, um, well, according to one report we've had here, it took place just before he took off. And now we are told that the oath of office was administered by U.S. District Judge Sarah T. Hughes. So Lyndon Johnson is now the 36th President of the United States succeeding to the presidency upon the death of John Kennedy, killed by an assassin's bullet in Dallas this afternoon. Former President Eisenhower has issued a statement on the assassination of President Kennedy. The statement was issued from his suite at the Waldorf in New York. Um, General Eisenhower says, I share the sense of shock and dismay that all Americans feel at the despicable act that resulted in the death of our nation's president. Mrs. Eisenhower and I also join with all other citizens in expressing our personal grief and our prayerful concern to Mrs. Kennedy and all other members of the family. General Eisenhower has been spending a day or so in New York. Uh, he's come up from Gettysburg, and the statement was, was issued by his longtime aide, Brigadier General Robert Schultz. And now we're going to switch again to London uh, and CBS News Ale correspondent Alexander Kendrick, who uh, has further reaction on the assassination of President Kennedy. Alex? Yes, Dallas. First of all, the Queen, who is staying in the country with friends privately this weekend, was told of President Kennedy's death, and she is sending a personal message of sympathy. This is what Buckingham Palace said tonight. Now, the Prime Minister, as I reported before, is on his way back to Number 10 Downing Street from the country. Meanwhile, Number 10 has issued this statement. The Prime Minister has learned with the most profound shock and horror of the death by assassination of the President of the United States. A uh, more formal and fuller statement will be issued by the Prime Minister later this evening. The leader of the opposition, of the Labour opposition, Harold Wilson, was making a speech at a meeting up in North Wales this afternoon, this evening, when the news came of the President's death. And he also uh, issued uh, a statement, which I have right here. Uh, I am sure, said Mr. Wilson, that I'm speaking for everyone here, for the whole Labor Party throughout the country, indeed for everyone in this country, when I express our deep horror at this evil act. I pay tribute to one who has been a good friend of this country, a great world statesman, and a great fighter for peace. His great struggle for racial equality in the United States is something that will, in memory, long outlive his life. A former Prime Minister, Sir the former Sir Anthony Eden, now the Earl of Avon, issued this statement. The news is appalling. This is tragic news for the United States and for the free world. The sympathy of us all will go out to Mrs. Kennedy and the rest of the family. The President's exceptional qualities of firm but patient diplomacy have been recognized by us all as a service to peace. Young in experience but wise in heart, the whole free world will be mourning him. Also, uh, Westminster Cathedral, which is the uh, heart of the Catholic population of, of Britain, uh, announced tonight that uh, the De Profundis was said tonight in the cathedral for the repose of the soul of President Kennedy, and the 12.30 Mass tomorrow will be a requiem for the President. Solemnly, su uh, subsequently, there will be a solemn pontifical requiem Mass, which will be announced as soon as the funeral arrangements have been made. Uh, incidentally, Dallas, it's of some comment that the American embassy here in London uh, has suddenly become a focal point for uh, scores of people who have just uh, congregated outside the uh, embassy hoping for news about the president. And uh, the switchboard at the embassy has been flooded with hundreds of calls, many, of course, from Americans living in England. And uh, uh, among these were a great many servicemen who are on duty in various places throughout England. 
And uh, it's perhaps uh, an ironic note that in the uh, entrance hall of the American Embassy here, there is a small statue of President Lincoln, uh, which reminded people that President Kennedy was not the first president to meet his death in this fashion. Alex, uh, people have been gathering in the United States, too, in large cities and also in small, I'm quite sure. Uh, as we passed the Associated Press building a while ago, we saw people gathered outside the windows where they have a, a high-speed ticker that was, it was bringing the latest. And, of course, as you walk along the streets, you see people with radios held up to their ears, portable radios, uh, listening to the uh, latest details on the assassination of the president. All the car radios are on. And I would say that it's undoubted that uh, a sense of shock, dismay, and... Uh, and incredulity, I imagine, uh, are, is sweeping across the United States. It's interesting uh, that both Harold Wilson, the leader of the opposition, and former Prime Minister Avon, uh, whose statements you referred to a moment ago, emphasized Mr. Kennedy's uh, services to the cause of world peace. I should imagine that uh, when the uh, history books are written about the Kennedy administration, this probably will go down as his principal service, his, his uh, untiring efforts to, uh, to reach an accommodation, if not an agreement, with the uh, heads of the communist world so that the uh, world could be spared the devastation of a nuclear war. Yes, Dallas, that's the reaction that the British have, too. They think of him, even though he was a young man, comparatively speaking, they think of him as the leader of the West who, although armed with uh, strength which was unheard of before this century, uh, nevertheless uh, used that strength uh, in order to uh, seek accommodation. What would you say, Alex, about the feeling of the uh, average uh, individual Briton? Uh, did they have a strong personal affection for the president? Was he a remote figure, or was he somebody whom they understood and and liked as a as a as a personality? He was by no means a remote figure. I think he was as well known here as uh, the le leaders of the British government. As a matter of fact, he was he was probably uh, more popular and better known to the average Briton than uh, let us say half the members of the of the cabinet uh, who uh, go about their uh, routine tasks in a very routine way. But the president had a flair about him, and I must say the British correspondents in America were very good about reporting uh, on every phase of uh, the Kennedy family and the Kennedy career, so that uh, uh, the impact of, the, of Kennedy in, in this country was uh, an immediate one. I mean, people uh, heard his voice uh, every time he made a speech. The BBC was uh, always on the ball, bringing uh, his uh, press conferences uh, over by radio. Uh, he appeared on uh, uh, television news programs uh, almost every evening, and uh, there was this feeling that uh, this man, uh, as the British have always regarded us anyway, this man w was a cousin, so to speak, and uh, someone they knew and someone uh, they could uh, feel with uh, when he felt uh, strongly as he did about some of the uh, political issues in our country.